you are tuned to Farther Out. I'm your host, Douglas Lucas. This episode is part of a series of similar discussions with original members of the Process Church of the Final Judgment about their personal experiences with the group, as well as some of their theology, practices, and more. Today's talk is with John Harvey. When and why did you join the process? What attracted you to the group? Well, it would be 1967 when I was 20 or just coming up for my 20th birthday. I was working in the King's Road, Chelsea in London as um, a short order chef in one of a chain of cafes called the Cardoma. And whilst out and about on the King's Road, I came across somebody selling the magazine, the process magazine. So I bought a copy of it. Um, And in the magazine, it said that uh, they were based in Balfour Place in Mayfair and that they had a coffee bar there. And just there was something intriguing about it. And I think, I'm not sure if it was the first time I went along, I went with a former school friend or not. But anyway, I went there and just like the atmosphere, there were uh, a bunch of people who seemed to be regulars there that um, I found interesting to just get to chat to. The American embassy was just around the corner then. Um, and uh, quite a lot of the teenage um, sons and daughters of um, people involved in the embassy um, tended to drop in to this coffee bar. So it was interesting. And I got talking to the people who were running the process and um started going to some of the events that they had they used to um they used to have things like trials where they would try um famous people from history uh the pope um churchill the royal family they had um various activities like that they showed films on a friday and saturday evening and so i i started hanging out there probably at least i would think two or three times a week what happened during your first meeting? Well, the first meeting, I mean, it is it is a long time ago. I was going to the coffee bar regularly, enjoying hanging out there, enjoying talking to other visitors and also members of the process. And then I think it was suggested that I might like to join. And I said I was interested because I was just, all I was doing was working as a short order chef uh, at the time on what today would be counted as minimum wage. So I was, yes, I said I'd like to. And they said, well, if you join, you'll be working here. We'll pay you a sum of money um, each week. And you can live in, they had a like a duplex in Wigmore Street, which is just around the corner from Harley Street in uh, London, which had previously been their headquarters. And they said, you can live there. So this was great. I, I could then walk to and fro. It was a short walk. Um, to the process in Balfour Place. And I can't remember how long after, it was probably not very long after I joined, that they said, well, it would be good if you actually started doing sessions. Now, these sessions were hugely expensive, um, and you either bought a half hour or an hour. And from memory, I think an hour's session was probably something like 75 percent of what they were paying me for a week's work so it was a big deal i didn't have much else to spend money on i i bought some food for myself but a lot of the time i'd eat there um i didn't have any rent to pay and oh yes no it's also a requirement once it morphed into being the church of the final judgment that um we all had to dress in black and were expected to allow our hair to grow and beards to grow and to wear a large silver crucifix about two and a half inches, I suppose, um, which they supplied. So that was all fine. Um, And we were given a notebook or we supplied a notebook when we had these sessions. And so we went in, sat opposite the, um, in quotes, telepath. And the way it worked was that he or she, in my case it was a he, would ask a question which I would consider without speaking. 
And and this sounds a bit crazy. After a, a pause, the telepath would tell me what my answer was. Now, not surprisingly, this sort of uh, thing led to newspapers at the time referring to them as the mind benders of Mayfair and such like. It's sort of understandable. Unfortunately, years ago, I lost the notebook I had. But I remember, I, I can't remember how many sessions I had, but if we briefly fast forward to when I decided to leave, which was a very emotional thing, and I remember going into, I was my work there involved several things. I would be waiting on table in Satan's Cavern, which was the name of the cafe. I would be doing cleaning and I would be their projectionist on for the Friday and Saturday films. And I'd also sometimes do other things, like when Timothy Leary made a visit, I was told I was the one chosen to introduce him, which um, I felt very nervous about doing. So when it came to the point where I decided to leave, because I'd seen sort of what I saw as cracks in this philosophy, I remember going into the kitchen and Father Mendes, as Gregory Castle then was, was in the kitchen working. Um, and I said to him, I blurted out, you know, I decided to leave the process and burst into tears. And he was really very kind. I mean, he stopped what he was doing and gave me some time to just talk a bit about it and said, well, if that's what you want to do, you might want to have a, a last session before you go. So I said, OK, I would do that. And I had a half hour last session. But it's important to emphasise that at no point did anybody say or do anything to try and dissuade me. All I received was sort of a slightly baffled kindness because they were baffled that I wanted to leave, but they were kindly. And after I'd left, just weeks after, the News of the World, the now defunct newspaper here that came out on Sundays, ran a piece about the mind-benders of Mayfair, a two-page so-called expose with a number of errors in it. And I realised that if I contacted them, I could probably get quite a fat check in exchange for my story. And to my ongoing surprise over the decades, and I have to say pleasure that I, I decided not to do that. And the reason I decided not to do it was not that I wasn't hard up because I was, but because I felt that my experience there, and I still feel this, had been very helpful to me. When you joined, did you have any kind of initiation ceremony? It seems weird to say I can't remember. I think the reason I can't remember is that there wasn't any particular initiation ceremony. There was, however, when it became a church, because when I joined it, it was just the process. And then I think it was around New Year's Eve of um, the end of 1967 that it was announced that they were going to now become the Church of the Final Judgment. Um, which wasn't a great surprise because all the way along they'd been talking about what they described as the three gods of um, Jehovah, Lucifer and Satan. But they decided that it was now going to be the Church of the Final Judgment. And they had a, a ceremony then where we were all baptised with fire and water, which sounds quite sort of cinematic, but in fact... The water was just a bowl with some water in it, um, in the way that um, churches might have holy water. And the fire was a rather budget version of a fire, I suppose, for health and safety. It was basically a, a gas bottle under a, a dish with a sort of jet coming through, a small jet. And the, the person doing the ordination just briefly, momentarily put their fingers into the flame and then you know, touched your forehead, I think it was, and the same with the water. And that it was at that point that I became Brother Zachary. How was your name chosen? Yeah, I wish I could tell you. Um, all I can say is that Robert de Grimston, who was the sort of founder of um, the process with his wife, he was in America throughout my time in London, so I never met him, but all the names came from him. So we were just told that Robert has said that your name will be. I can't, I'm pretty sure nobody actually said, and it's because 
it was just you know brother Zachary. Describe a day in the life of a procession. It was a quite a long day actually. So I I was living in the flat in Wigmore Street, and I'd get up. Can't remember what time, but I'd get up early enough to just have a quick breakfast in the flat. Then I'd walk past the American Embassy um, and into Balfour Place. And the day began with cleaning duties. I remember that um, I didn't have much experience as a 20-year-old man of cleaning, but now I was, amongst other things, the cleaner. And they had, just on the, in the entrance to Balfour Place, they had a beautifully polished wooden floor, which most days I had to not polish, but they had a sort of a liquid that you spread over and it then quite quickly hardened and turned into this beautiful sort of cover for the wood underneath. So I did that. I cleaned the bathrooms. I cleaned up in the kitchen, the, the cafe. Um, and then as the day wore on, I'd probably have a break. And um, then... By the afternoon, I'd be waiting table in Satan's cavern. And in fact, on one occasion um, in the evening, uh, one of the customers was Barry Humphreys, you know, Dame Edna. Yeah. Um, this was when he was a drinking alcoholic and he came in from his one man show and was very drunk. Um, and I had to get him, as I did with anybody, to sign a temporary membership card. And he signed over the entire thing. And I remember he left his umbrella behind and I had to chase after him and give it back. So I'd be waiting on table. And there were quite a few people um, of note then. The woman who was in The Girl from Uncle, I remember, was uh, used to come in. And um, one or two other people, of course, Marianne Faithful and such like. Anyway, so that was I'd be doing that in the evening. And then Fridays and Saturdays was a really long day because then I'd be the projectionist. And they had more than one showing of the film. They had a 16 millimeter sound projector and I would sit behind the a screen. And most of the films were two, sometimes three reels long. And so I'd be projecting the films and hidden behind the screen. And on one occasion, I was mortified to um, be woken up by one of the paying customers because I was so tired. I'd fallen asleep and they were just <laughs> left with the sound of the film flicking round. So they came behind the curtain to wake up the projectionist. What were some of the films shown at those events and why? The one that I can remember, and I looked it up since remembering it, um, when Neil Edwards decided to make the film about the process, was called The Seashell and the Clergyman. Yeah. It was made in 1928, um, a surrealist film which... The only bit of it I can remember was the clergyman sort of crawling along in a gutter. Um, it made no sense to me. So they showed films like that, many of which didn't make a lot of sense, but were sort of quite non-mainstream. But they did also show the original version of The Haunting. Now, I particularly remember that, because having seen that and going back to the flat in Wigmore Street, where for some weeks I was the only person living there, it was a big flat, and I remember being terrified, going up in the lift at about one or two in the morning, knowing that there was just this empty flat ahead of me, having seen this film. <laughs> you mentioned a little bit about your time working as a waiter at Satan's Cavern. What was the atmosphere, decor, etc. there like? Well, it was great, actually. It was very friendly. There was always music playing. And there were always interesting people to talk to. I mean, it sounds crazy, but, and I think I mentioned this in Neil's film, um, I never realised you could drink orange juice hot. They didn't serve alcohol. In fact, um, drink and drugs were forbidden in the process. And I never saw or got any sense that anybody was um, involved with them. But um, so one of the drinks on the menu was hot orange which I particularly liked. So hot orange, cinnamon toast, and various other things, um, all at reasonable prices. So interesting company, decent cheap food. The whole place, all the walls, I think, were painted black. I think the tables were black. Everything was black. There were candles on the table. Or oh, one of the people I met there, who was the brother of somebody else who had joined, she was when I knew her, she was Sister Mercedes. 
and she then stayed around long enough to be promoted to Mother Mercedes. And her brother was Caleb Ashburton Dunning. And I remember him particularly because he was one of the people I'd regularly hang out with, along with others, you know, sitting there chatting. And he got a job with the Beatles when they opened their shop in Baker Street, London, um, which they called it Apple, and it, they were selling clothes. And Caleb was employed to attend their weekly management meetings and throw I Ching and um, read tarot cards. They paid him £20 a week in the 60s, which was a lot of money for an afternoon's work. Yeah. What was the atmosphere among the members as a community? It was friendly. And there were only a few times where I saw anybody other than friendly and being cross. And that was with me because there was an occasion, I think it may have been when the church actually was founded or there was some ceremony. And there was some guy in the, the audience, as it were, who was so moved by the, um, non, the anti-materialist message that he spontaneously pulled the five pound note out of his pocket and went down and set it on fire in this little bowl of flame I mentioned previously. And I was horrified at this in the sense that, good grief, he's just burned a fiver. And so in the kitchen later on, I said, I believe it's possible if the ash isn't too badly destroyed, and this is nonsense, of course, to take the um, your five pound note or the, the ashes to the bank, and they might give you five pounds. So I mentioned this, and a quarter of an hour later, Father Lucius, who was the head of the London chapter, as it was called, and to whom I rarely spoke because he was very elevated, he came into the kitchen and basically tore me off a strip for, for suggesting an action that would undermine the um, sacrifice of the person and the meaning behind it. So I was like, oh, OK, um, I hadn't thought of that. I just, <laughs> thought of the, I just thought of the money. Did everybody live together communally? Yeah, the senior members lived, because this place in Balfour... This um, house in Balfour Place, I revisited it recently just from the outside because it's a private dwelling now. In fact, my impression of that area of Mayfair was as though sort of money like ivy had overgrown all the properties. So I stood outside and just looked at it. But it was such a huge property. The restaurant cafe was in the basement and there were lots of rooms that were for events. And then there were more rooms up at the top where people lived. I never lived there because I lived during my time in Wigmore Street. But the more senior people, um, they all lived in Balfour Place. How did people outside the group react to it generally? I think generally um, people reacted with enthusiasm. They found that the message was one that appealed to them. Mostly they were young people, not all. But mostly there were young people, by which I mean late teens through 20s. And there was an enthusiasm. I was never aware of anybody being sort of taken aside and it suggested that they might want to join or donate. Although donations was a thing. Uh, so if you had money, there was a sort of expectation that you might hand it over. Now, I didn't have any money apart from what they paid me. Um, but I I knew that when I was 21, I would come into a small inheritance. I mean, it was small. I mean, they, even then it was small. It was about £300. And I became aware of the closing gap between the date when I would come into this inheritance and a rising sense that I didn't really want to hand it over, which helped me to focus on what I saw as the shortcomings of their philosophy. I wanted to talk a little bit about the theology of the group, how the group viewed the relationships of Jehovah, Lucifer, Satan, and Christ. I wanted to ask if you would describe that. Well, this arose, as I understand it, because it was already around when I joined. It arose out of their interest in various um, psychological theories, particularly, I think, um, uh, Adler and Jung. And following on from that, they decided, and I don't know quite how this formulated, because it already happened when I came along, that all of us human beings were 
psychologically stroke spiritually aligned to one of the three either jehovah lucifer or satan and the alignment could be determined by understanding the sort of psychological ticks and preferences um, likes dislikes and so on their argument was that um it was helpful to if you wanted to emerge from what they called the gray forces of mediocrity to recognize which of the three you were aligned to and to develop the personal qualities that indicated that alignment so it was more psychological than spiritual that was certainly my understanding of it although there might be some people who would disagree i mean the church of the final judgment it didn't involve as far as i can recall any uh, particularly active worshipping of anything although there was a belief that um uh in fact before i left the belief was that christ had returned to the earth and was not surprisingly um in your part of the world and would soon uh make his presence known to others and in fact it was my enthusiasm for this message that led me off my own back because they didn't encourage me to do it and in fact i got into a little bit of trouble for doing it i decided to go and speak at speaker's corner one sunday um i don't know if you know speaker's corner in london i was going to ask you about that what was speaker's corner and well speaker's corner has been going for decades it's by marble arch it's a large um sort of paved area adjoining Hyde Park where for a very long time I mean I remember going as even before I spoke there people like Donald Soper who was um, a pacifist famous pacifist he and others would speak there and basically anybody could just turn up and preferably stand on something to make themselves seen and then start talking to the air in the hope that people would gather around now, I was so enthusiastic about the message of Christ having returned and the process generally. And interestingly, the process in the Church of the Final Judgment, they weren't really strong on proselytizing. But I, I got the bug and I thought, I'll go and speak at Speaker's Corner. Now, I'm a 20-year-old, quite shy uh, young man at this time. So this was a very frightening thing to do. And... But for some reason, I was fired up by the idea. And my friend, Brother Anatole, I asked him if he would help. And to this day, I still think that the idea I came up with was a brilliant way of getting a quick crowd, because I didn't want to just start speaking to nobody. So I, there, I, there we, the two of us were, both dressed in black with silver crucifixes, long hair and beards. And I positioned my box, which I had painted black, quite near to a group of probably about two dozen or more people listening to somebody else speaking. So I stood on the box, and as I did so, my friend brother Anatole, from a little distance away, called out to me, who are the servants of the un-god? And I pointed to the crowd listening to the other guy and shouted back, they are. You can imagine, if you weren't in, totally enthralled to the other guy, you'd like, what? What's he saying? About half of them just peeled away and I had an instant audience and off I went. So I was initially very nervous, but in fact, I, it, that, I, I mean, that was a, trans, for me, that was a transformative experience because like when I was at school, I would not intentionally speak in class. And now I was doing that and um, uh, it was transformative. Did Jehovians people that were aligned with Jehovah dressed differently than those more inclined to Satan, etc. No, we all dress the same. In fact, I was told and willingly accepted and can see even to this day why it was the case. I was told that I was a Jehovian. You know, they're the sort of more sort of, um, I suppose, rule bound, you know, we're going to do this properly sort of people. Uh, but we all wore the same clothes. I've read about the telepathy developing circles and healing meditations and things like that. Were those member specific as opposed to open to the public? Open to the public. In fact, now you say that, I think it's 
probable, I hadn't thought of this before, I think I probably had my first session with a telepath before I joined. So I actually spent money that they hadn't paid me for doing work on a session. They were definitely open to the public. And then more recently, and I, I'm not sure who said this, it might well have been um, Malachi, as he's kept the name Malachi, although he's obviously no longer anything to do with them. And I think it was him who more recently said, of course, you know, we weren't, we weren't actually telepaths in the full meaning of the word reading people's minds. He said it was a form of um, sort of developed empathy, which I think, you know, is a pretty much you know, looking back on my experiences, what I would have expected. What were some important texts for the group? They had a small bookshop there which sold books both written by people within the process, almost exclusively Robert de Grimston himself. So, for example, the ones that come to mind, there would be three books on war. So there was Jehovah on war, Satan on war, and Lucifer on war. And these were um, perspectives, almost philosophical tracts, if you like, from the position, from the psychological position of those three. Yeah, I've collected a few of those, Exit, Humanity is the Devil, a few others. I've always found them really very interesting on a, on a philosophical and even spiritual level. Yes, well, I think, I think they were well written. And I think I did find one I downloaded a, a few years ago. I um, can't remember which one. It might have been Satan on War. I don't think there was anything bad in this. And in fact, when, when Neil's film was shown at the Barbican in London with a follow-up uh, Q&A of himself and myself, afterwards a couple of people came up and introduced themselves and one of them was the brother of Robert de Grimston and I hadn't really you know thought about him having any siblings or anything I'd never met him and it, but he came up and he'd been a member of his brother's organization and um, initially when he was introduced I thought crikey what's he going to say about what I've said and the answers to these questions is he going to be critical and he said he thought I got it right and he said, looking back, I don't think we did any harm. He said, I think we were perhaps just a bit naive. You mentioned that drugs and alcohol were forbidden. What was the group's attitude toward romantic relationships? Well, it's an interesting question, that, because my own direct experience is to say that I don't, I don't know. But subsequently, I think through the research that Neil did and then myself taking a, a fresh interest in looking at what happened after I left. I can only say this secondhand. I, mean, I heard that there were suggestions that people were sort of encouraged and some might even say coerced into relationships. But that was never any experience that I had directly or heard anything about. I mean, looking back, I wasn't aware. And I say this as somebody who wasn't just busy cleaning and serving hot oranges. I mean, there were occasions when I'd be upstairs in more of the inner sanctum, uh, having meals together with the senior members. And I was never aware of anything that surprised me that I hadn't thought of before. I'm No doubt that were relationships and so on, but I wasn't aware of any. What's one of your favorite process memories? Well, speaking at, high, at Speaker's Corner, I would never have done anything like that had it not been for the process. So that's one from just me slightly outside of it. From within the process, do you know, I think probably the real sense of companionship and being, being understood. What's one negative thing that you took away from being a member? I mean, I left because... I'd fallen out of love with it. And I, I saw what I thought were um, shortcomings. And I remember once, it was on a Sunday, and I was walking from the flat in Wigmore Street to the process, and I was going to start work, I think, um, around, I don't know, 2 o'clock that day, maybe earlier. But there was a cafe in, in Wigmore Street, and... Um, I went in and ordered a full English breakfast. And I remember eating this 
and recognizing with a rising sense of disquiet that this wasn't just me enjoying the meal this was this food was somehow compensating for a growing sense of upset that i was feeling and unhappiness and when i'd finished i ordered it again and i didn't need to i didn't need to eat any more but it was because it was that was quite a, a wake up call and i realized how unhappy i was and fortunately and perhaps even because of a growing self awareness and understanding realized what was going on it wasn't long after that that i had my tearful encounter with uh, father mendes when i said i'm leaving what was the essence of the process i think the essence of the process was it was well intentioned it was looking for the strengths in people and how people could um work on those strengths rather like going to a gym and working out physically so that they would become better able to deal with you know the the issues that lie through at them anything else you'd like to share i'm grateful for your interest really because um, i mean it was a strange time in a way but it was for me as i've said before it was um uh hugely positive um I mean, I don't know how different I'd be now if I hadn't spent that year and a bit there. I suspect there would be differences that I would not be happy with.